Hello and welcome to Cabal Whisperings here on the Geek Cabal channel. This is episode 2 and today's date is August 10th, 2023 for those who are listening in the future. Yes, it'll be important. Oh, you want to know my name, okay. <laughs> um, well, you said we're just doing intros here. You could have said, yeah, you yeah, could have yeah. started your intro. You're here. right, I could have. Um, well, I'm Jim, and I'm here uh, joined today with uh, Bobby. We nah. may may or may not cut that out. I don't know. We'll see. No, no, that's staying in. Pe- people like authenticity. Plus, we already told them we don't have writers, so. But, hey, maybe someone on the writer's strike will see this and be like, those guys need some help. I'll be like, you working for free? No. Well, we still need help. But... <laughs> All right, so, <laughs> so we've got some uh, stuff to go over uh, with the channel. And the channel information? Uh, yeah, we have some channel information. Uh, just a general note, uh, we were at Gen Con over the last weekend. That's why the uh, there was kind of a lull in some of the video activity uh, for those of you that were trying to watch anything new in that period. Same thing kind of with the Facebook. I mean, we did have the Gen Con post on Facebook, but yeah, um, it was pretty light on any new videos or anything like that. Uh, yeah, in fact, if you're not on our Facebook group, you should check it out. We do have, I posted a number of pictures. Uh, Jim, I believe you posted some pictures as well. And uh, I have more pictures yet that I'm going to post uh, once I sort through them. Uh, we might also put up a picture montage as a video here on YouTube. We did last year, so we might do it again this year, you know, to be determined. Uh, so, some uh, just general notes. Uh, after uh, We're recording this after the first episode has been uploaded. And is now available. So now I have an idea of how things actually look on that end as far as uploading to YouTube for their podcast section. So I have a little bit better idea of how we want to structure things here. And so going forward, the general idea is we're going to try to do a weekly episode. If we get really good, we're actually going to schedule it for a certain day uh, as far as putting it up. We're going to record it someday during the week and then put it up on a specific day. Uh, So there's probably going to potentially be a little bit of a gap between when we record, which is why we said the date, uh, versus when it goes up. So like if something happens in those intervening days, yeah, we're probably going to talk about it on that podcast. Uh, The downside of everyone's schedule is not gelling and uh, the uh, editing process taking a little bit of time. So that's that's just one thing. Uh, We are going to number the episodes. Uh, I've seen some people do seasons. I guess if we do a season, I don't know, we'll figure that out. Maybe maybe for a year or something, that'll be the season. So there won't be an episode 53 ever. I don't know. We'll figure it out. Or there won't be seasons. I don't know. So, uh, excuse me. So one other thing uh, on that kind of topic we are also going to do another set of podcasts that are going to be more of our long-form content. So if you're one of the people that picked this up for the audio-only option, uh, we have a few videos already that I'm going to put in that group uh, once we get that going, which will probably be very shortly, and it'll have a very similar name. It'll probably just be this name plus, like, long-form or single topic or something. Uh, those will probably not be weekly, just because it's going to be us doing a single topic and like a deeper dive into it. Uh, so they may be a little more sporadic, but who knows? We might have enough to go weekly. We'll just have to see, but I'm just saying at the moment, don't expect weekly. Um, and the main other thing is to keep an eye out. We are going to be doing a number of videos talking about what we saw and did at Gen Con. And those are going to be, we're going to try to get those quickly because the event was just last weekend and you know if it's like the middle of October and we're still pumping out those videos unless they're really popular for some reason in which case we'll still pump pump them out but if we're at that point then something has gone wrong in the creative process because we're hoping to get more than myself and Jim together to discuss just to have a lengthy discussion of what we did what we saw what we liked what we disliked talk about maybe stuff for next year but we also picked up, or at least, uh, Jim, I know you picked up a few things, and yep. I picked up probably way too many things, so there's going to be a lot of reviews. Those could easily be going into October, uh, but those are not going to be on the podcast part, for the most part, because they're highly visual. Uh, but there's some books, uh, which we're going to talk about here in a moment, that uh, they might be because you don't need to see the book. So, And on that note... 
I might also shift over my Battletech book reviews into the single uh, single topic podcast thing. Uh, they're not very long, but they're a single topic, and you don't need to be able to see anything unless you really want to, unless you're dying to know what the cover looks like, because it's a book. I'm explaining to you what happened in the book. So, uh, so for this, however. Like I said, we're trying to look at a uh, an actual structure of some kind, so we're probably going to stick with a set of topic, well, topic genres, themes, I, I don't know. You, you'll understand here in a second, hopefully. And we'll discuss things that occur in those topics, uh, and then we'll have a miscellaneous at the end. We're just going to discuss whatever, and like we're doing here, we'll discuss channel business up at the very front. Uh, so, at the moment, the tentative set of topics are... Movies, uh, streaming. Now, the reason we're kind of separating those, movies is going to be more about uh, movies that are presently in theaters, movies that are coming up, where we're talking about like movies are still in production, uh, and also movies that just came to streaming. Like for this week, uh, that would be uh, the Transformers, the latest Transformers movie just recently came out on streaming. Uh, I believe Mario just came out on Peacock. And, you know, things like that. Whereas the streaming topic is going to be either older movies that we watched on there, or the series that are on there, or just movies that have been on there for a while. Things like that. Like, I watch a lot of older horror movies on there, and I've done videos on some of them. Actually, more just the rando videos I see on there. But that's kind of going to shift over to that. Um, and then we'll talk about books, which would be both actual books, uh, digital books, comic books, audiobooks, you know, whatever format we're consuming those in. Gaming, that'll be board games, role-playing games, uh, video games. Now, any of those that require more visual stuff, we might talk about the topic, but we might do a separate video where you actually have the, video, the visual part. And then miscellaneous is what it sounds like, and when we get to that this time, you'll see just how miscellaneous it can be. I don't know what you're talking about, Missile. I mean, hell, every one of our topics goes into the... <laughs> Goes into the uh, realm of miscellaneous. So. Yeah, yeah, it does. No. So, uh, and we're going to try to stick to that rough order. You know, we might add other topics at some point if we see that there's something else trending that we want to talk about. Uh, or if one of these just, like, falls apart, we're going to drop it. So, But this is the structure we're going with for the moment, just so there's, like, a... So you guys have an expectation of roughly what we're going to talk about. And, uh, yeah, so... Here goes. We're going to start with movies. Jim? All right. So, um, Bobby hasn't seen it yet, but I've watched uh, Transformers Rise of the Beast. And I have to say, uh, I, liked, I liked Bumblebee. I thought Bumblebee was a great departure from what had came before. I mean, I did like the, ori the original. I do have one question before you continue. I hate to interrupt you. Is this in continuity with any of the previous movies? No. Okay. No. At least I don't believe it. If it is, I don't know how. Okay. But uh, they may be, because it, maybe they threw it all the way back in the past, but I thought in the first one, they came from outer space in the first movie. They landed on Earth. Like, you know, because that's where they yeah, had... Yeah, I mean, some of, some of the other movies don't appear to be in continuity with some of the other movies. So I, I was just curious. I, I'm pretty sure, like I'm pretty said, sure it's not, it. because because uh, as much as... I do actually like the very first Michael Bay Transformers movie. I thought it was a good movie. Not a great movie, but a good movie. I thought Bumblebee was definitely a better movie. Again, I don't know why they had to go with the Bumblebee losing his voice. That's where it kind of seems like it, maybe they were trying to keep the continuity. Maybe maybe that was something that happened in the comics. I don't know. But this does take place after Bumblebee. It doesn't actually play on anything from the beginning or from that from that movie. Um, but they do make mention of the um, of Hawkeye two uh, actress Haley Steinfeld. Yes. Um, they said, oh, we knew you cared about her, but, you know, you know, kind of back often like, yeah, screw those people. Um, <laughs> well, and the, the, the main character in this movie kind of gets pulled in because he's, uh, and gosh, dang it, I, I should, I should remember the one, um, Mirage. Yeah. Mirage is the one is like kind of the main transformer they follow in this one. Okay. Um, Bumblebee's in there, but he's definitely kind of a side character in this. But uh, guy's trying to uh, steal Mirage, and Mirage gets called to uh, you know Optimus saying, "Hey, you know, 
giant beacon light in the sky that we can see that no one else can see just got activated. We need to go see what the hell it is. Okay. Kind of thing. So, um, again, it was, it, I, I like the fact that they actually kind of explained where the, um, where, um, the, uh, Maximals came from. Like they weren't originally here. They, they were teleported over here after, uh, Unicron destroyed their planet. Okay. And, um, Again, I don't know how they know any of the Optimus, but you know Optimus Prime will tells Optimus Prime that he's named after him, kind of thing. But, uh, but overall, I mean, so what you're saying is they don't go with the lore from the cartoon where the Maximals and the or the Predacons, no, are uh, actually from the future, but go to Earth in the past. They, at least, if, if they did explain anything like that, it it. It wasn't mentioned very well. I don't know. I just know they had been on Earth for, like, for, you know, a decent long time. They've actually, like, Maximals had kind of, like, integrated with, like, people. Like, hmm. Okay. Um, like, there was, like, you know, I don't, I don't remember where they were at, but they were at some, like, ancient village, and, like, they were just, like, animals in the wild for them, you know. They knew what they were, but they were protectors. Well, in Beast Wars, there were people there, right? I remember right. I'm, because initially they worshipped, I think, Waspinator like a king once everyone else left. Because he got stuck behind whenever they finally left to go back to the future. And then they, like, catapulted him into space or something. That I don't know. It's been a while since I've seen Beast Wars, folks. But... I mean, Beast Wars is the, the pinnacle of CGI. Um... What? <laughs> Come on. I think we all know that goes to... Uh... What's the one that actually takes place inside of a computer? Not Tron, but as a cartoon. Yeah, I know what you're. I know what you're uh, referring to. Um, but no, I, I, I mean, I don't want to go into you know too many spoilers. But I mean, the um, the Maximals come to Earth with a device that Unicron wants and needs, and it's not the leadership of Matrix. Um, it is something else. You know, but uh, like some of the problems, like like with the Dinobots and the. Um, I don't know, the Age of Extinction. Reboot. Um, yeah, that, that was the show I was trying to think of, folks. Uh, they they explain where everybody came from and why they were on Earth, and it so it made sense, and it didn't feel like it was out of place. And again, not perfect storytelling, but um, it was, I think, better. And the trans the, oh, the one thing I wanted to mention is they actually got Optimus Prime's transformation to the truck right. Because there's a point where he's running from an explosion, and when he's running, he like falls onto his legs as his body oh, folds, like, like his arms go into his side and everything. Like yes, that. okay, it, not not just random bits of metal shifting around. Yeah, well, because the way it worked before is that the front of his legs are are actually yeah, they're, they're, the tires are down at the bottom of his legs. So they become the back end of the truck, of the it, chassis where the where the trailer would attach. But his body has to spin. Like his his chest yeah, is facing right. the wrong way, that's right. so somehow he gets it where he he does that he his body you know twists and yes his arms come into the side his and, head like yes all right and one of the best looking trans you know transformation scenes in a Transformers movie now, I have to ask though did a trailer randomly appear out of nowhere and attach to him no oh well no he never I, had, you, you can't have everything I guess he never had a trailer but uh, there's only one. It, it, it's like I can say it's probably the best transforming scene, and then there's a little bit of a weird thing towards the end where, um, if you want to know spoilers, uh, Mirage does get uh, killed by one of the leader of the Predacons. Mm. Um, well, he's that Megatron. No, it's a Scourge. Scourge. Um, well, and it's a kind of a fake out death because like he dies. But before he dies, he somehow like says, "You, it's up to you now." Uh, and again, I, I need to look up what the name of the character is on that movie. Uh, but the the main human character, he says, "It's up to you now." And somehow Mirage's parts like start attaching to him and builds like builds like the the suit for Spike. Oh, okay. I thought we were going to go into like Tetsuo the Iron Man weird body horror stuff there for a moment. Total side diversion, folks. You want to see some weird Japanese horror movies where a man slowly turns into metal? Check out Tetsuo, the Iron Man. 
Noah Diaz. That's that's the character's name. What's uh, his name? An- Noah Diaz, played by Noah An- Diaz, played okay. by Anthony Ramos. So, um, yeah. So his character gets like Mirage is uh, like what's left at work wraps around him and becomes like a like the suit from the original okay. uh, '80s cartoon. Gotcha. Which is a good playback because in the '80s '80 uh, the '80s Transformer movie, uh, the humans did have robotic outfits that could transform somehow with them in it. Um, but th- they were fighting Unicron, which is the same thing they did here. But uh, I've seen a a thing that actually kind of makes fun of what you're talking about just now. It's a uh, the Clerks cartoon, Clerks animated series. It's like the it's got to be the third or fourth episode. Uh, there's a court case, and at the end, uh, instead of like finding for anyone, it, it just becomes a party, and it's literally like goes like Japanese anime. But I was like, oh, big America party, oh. Like, they all take off in a car, like, oh, who's driving? Oh, bear's driving. There's a bear driving the car. But a bunch of them get into a Transformer kind of car. When it gets to where it's going, it transforms back, and you just see, like, all a bunch of red fluid come pouring out of the car. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, you guys should have jumped out of that before you transformed. So, uh, uh, also, something else you folks should check out if you like the Jay and Silent Bob movies, the Clerks animated series. Second episode, Pure Genius. You know how all the shows last long enough they have a flashback episode? Well, their flashback episode is the second episode. So the only thing they can flashback to is the first episode. Genius. But continue. Okay. So the um, the, the, the well, there's a couple of... There's one kind of cool thing, because at first I thought they were kind of going to allude towards... Because um, the... Uh, Noah's character uh, gets approached after... He's trying to get a job. He's at a job interview, supposedly. And he gets approached, and... Um, it turns out, you know, that they knew everything that went on. They said, "So, how did it, you know? How did your 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 little trip go to?" And I think I want to say Peru. I think is where they went to. I could be wrong, but it was, I think it was Peru. And he goes, "What do you mean?" He's like, "You know, your friends down there that you saw." He's like, "Your big friends." You know, and at first I thought, "Oh, they're going to go with the um, sector." Is it Sector Seven? Sector, yeah, w- something like that. From the first Transformers movie, I said, "Okay, that's kind of a cool way to tie it, you know, tie it back in or whatever." And, you know, so it's like, I'm, I'm just waiting for him to see on the, you know, because he hands him a business card and you see him, you know, the wall opens up and there's a whole like facility down beneath with like craft and different things in there. And I'm thinking, okay, so they're going to reveal that this is what that is and that they've known about this tech for a while. And then he flips the card over and it says G.I. Joe on it. And I'm just like, you know, I... As good of as decent of a movie as it was, I'm like if they if they continue this on with somehow the GI Joes being either a part of it or its own separate thing that just at some point are going to merge. Yeah, I'm all cool with that because it, I think it's it's setting up something good. Now, the part that was kind of like oh this is kind of dumb is I guess somehow Noah at the end takes the suit he has, rebuilds a hodgepodge Porsche, and Mirage comes back at the end, and I'm like. I'm like, I don't think it's just like you can be a mechanic and put together a transformer, but <laughs> okay. Uh, you wouldn't think so, but... Now, from the comic I was reading, though, um, I guess in the comic, it, uh, Optimus did not have the leadership of Matrix. He actually had a the um, a creation Matrix, which allowed him to create new transformers. Yeah, in the comics, that's what he has. Yeah, so that... Uh, so or, or I, the only ones I've read are the Generation Two books, and there, that's what he had. Because yeah. Megatron had made new Decepticons, but he needed that the uh, the Spark, the All Spark, something uh, to uh, to turn them on, to, to give them life. Because that's how the um, uh, uh, the Constructicons or whatever were made were from the um, actually from Optimus's uh, creation matrix. Because I guess somehow. They tied into him somehow, and in the comics, this is. And when he created his Transformers, somehow it fed into creating these other Transformers too, mm. because somehow they, they, they tied into his brain somehow. Like they had captured him for a while and implanted some in his head, so that when he would use the Creation Matrix, they would be able to use the Creation Matrix. Okay. And then they, that's when they created Devastator. So. Um, I see good things coming with this because um, I I think that you know 
I mean, there, there's there's still there's still some focus on a message and stuff like that, but it's it's definitely back to where it kind of should be, where you like let's let the story tell everything, let's let the story drive the, the narrative. That the only message here should be that some things are that sometimes things are more than meet the eye. Yes, and then knowing it's half the battle. Eventually, you know what the other half is. Red Legends and Blue Lasers. Well, no, sometimes. <laughs> but uh, at least according to Twisted Mago Theater, it's violence. There's a, an issue where the three and three quarter inch Joes invade like 12 inch tall Spider-Man's house. Well, the Cobras do. And uh, yeah, it's pretty hysterical. But at some point, you know, Duke's like, no one's half the battle. And Spider-Man's like, what's the other half? And Duke's like, violence. <laughs> and then they start shooting, but like they're shooting way above each other's heads. And Spider-Man's like, Duke, if you aim just a little bit lower, you're actually going to hit one of them. And, like, some random Cobra guy gets shot. And Cobra Commander's like, whoa, 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 Duke, what are you doing? You know this is not how we do things. Like, he had a family. And Duke's like, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. I shouldn't have listened to this guy. But it's pretty, it's pretty funny. Uh, but, on topic. Uh, from, whatever, from everything I've read, the initial plan was to use the Transformers movies as a jumping off point for the G.I. Joe movies. And supposedly, uh, we can thank Tyrese for just screwing it all up. Because he, like, blabbed about it, and they were like, dude, that was supposed to be a surprise. Now we can't do that. Because it was supposed to be those guys in the army from the first movie, apparently, were supposed to end up being, like, the Joes at some point, or some subset of Well, them. and I hear that a lot, because um, there was a comic book review I was listening to the other day. It was about um, Armageddon 2001. It's a, a DC line. And Monarch is a hero turned villain uh, kind of story arc, and in the future becomes like tyrannical and had, you know, killed all the other heroes off and stuff like that. And supposedly it was leaked that it was supposed to be Captain Adam who uh, had a, you know, like his family was killed or something, you know, you know, same thing as always, you know, stick, you know, stick the wife in the refrigerator kind of uh, moment for him where he becomes evil and somehow puts on a set of power armor that allows him to kill everybody, all the heroes. So is Monarch not Captain Adam? Nope. Huh. Because I actually have some issues with him in it. Like, I was pretty sure it was Captain Adam. It's Hawk. Hawk. From Hawk and Dove. Yeah, okay. Um, and all because... But like I said, it's Captain Adam. So anyway. It's supposed to be, yes. And it should have been because Hawk is not strong enough, regardless if you put him in power armor, to, to kill all the heroes. But... Um, I think that's a problem is that, yes, it sucks that a leak has gone out, but rushing to change your plans because of a league like that. Yeah. I mean, that's like, gosh, could you imagine when Mark Ruffalo mentioned about Infinity War being a bloodbath? Um, and, uh, uh, oh, God. Uh, Rhodes, I'm trying to think of the actor. Um, uh, Don Cheadle? Yes. He, um, he's like, dude, shut up. <laughs> like, right in the middle I of the mean, and, Yeah, but if, if you've read the comic that came out 30 years before the movie, almost, like, you know that Thanos wipes out half the life of the universe, like, in, like, issue one, if I remember right. So, I, it's not exactly... He, like, to me, the surprise was that the movie actually went for it. Well, you know, I think they should have gone full out and just had Thanos kill because he was in love with Lady Dev. Well, yeah. Um, instead I, of instead of trying to give him some reasoning behind it, he's the Mad Titan, not yeah, not the you know, not not the kind of reasonable, but his solutions are sketchy Titan. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, you know, yeah, I don't think his his solutions were ever noble. It shouldn't have been. Yeah, no, the the comic like in the movies they started there back in the first Avengers. You know, with the post credit scene there, but... Uh, so, anyways... So, uh, I had some other comments here real quick, yeah. Jim. Uh, but now I forgot what you said I was going to comment about. Well, we, we, we can always wrap it up. Uh, it'll come back to me here in a minute, though, but I'll, I'll go to the other thing. Uh, they, another company now has the comic book rights for both Transformers and G.I. Joe. And I'm hearing they're going to... Part of the relaunch is they're going to have an ongoing where the two universes are merged. I think they're still going to each do their own lines, but they're going to have an ongoing where they're collective one thing. 
And so it's clear that Hasbro really wants to do this. The comic books want to do this. So the movies are almost definitely going to want to do this. You know, because it's easy to do. It's a really easy way to explain the advanced technology that Cobra and G.I. Joe has. You know, and, well, they don't, and they don't have to interact a lot. You know, they just have to, each half needs to just know that they exist and occasionally acknowledge it. And then you're fine. Well, I was going to say, the one thing, the power suit that Noah wields in uh, The Rise of the Beast is almost eerily similar to the one that they had in the first G.I. Joe movie. The uh, the live-action G.I. Joe movie. Oh, the accelerator suit? Yep. You remember what accelerates? You. You. Yeah. I swear I think about that every time I see those accelerator blowers in the bathroom. And I didn't even like the first G.I. Joe movie all that much. No, no. Anyway, so... Uh. What did you, you what did you happen to watch on streaming? Uh, well, actually, because I don't think I talked about it last time, I want to talk about the last movie I actually saw in the theater, oh. which was the last newest Mission Impossible movie, uh, which I thought was good. Um, you kind of need to be caught up on the other Mission Impossible movies to know what the hell's going on. Only kind of. Uh, but the uh, minor spoiler here, because the trailers don't give this away, the villain is a rogue AI that wants to apparently control things. Uh, its motives are sketchy. It has demonstrated to the intel agencies that it can hit them anytime it wants to. Um, and you see a moment where they're at the some intel building in D.C. and everyone is busy making hard copies of all the files they have because they know at any moment they could all be corrupted by the A.I. And... Uh, so there's there's a, an interesting moment where Carrie Elway plays the director of intelligence and like the head of the CIA is there. That's Ritter from the first Mission Impossible movie. Uh, same actor. Like the head of like Navy intelligence is there and a couple other intel agencies. And so Ritter's getting ready to explain to him about the, the Mission Impossible team. And the other intel people are like, don't tell him. You know, you can't tell him. And he's like, wait a minute, I'm the director of national intelligence what can't I know here? And he's like, well, there's, a, there's another group that we turn to to solve these problems. The IMF. And he's like, the IMF? What does the World Bank have to do with any of this? He goes, no, no, that's the International Monetary Fund. I'm talking about the other IMF. He's like, what's it stand for? The Impossible Mission Force. And he's like, are you serious? It's like, well, you know, that's what it's for. And he explains that it's literally like, well, we give them assignments, and if they choose to accept, then they do them. He's like, so let me get this straight. When you guys can't solve your problems, you just drop a message off to some people that you don't really control, and they just do it, and that's that. And they're like, yeah, pretty much. And he's just like shaking his head like, oh my god. So, greatest part of the movie. But uh, no, the, uh, the, the stunts are all over the top, uh, like you come to expect. You know, Tom Cruise is actually doing like 90% of them, uh, which is amazing. And uh, the movie, it's part one of two. The movie actually does have like a natural ending point. It doesn't just like, well, time to roll the credits, I guess. Like, no, no, like the big action set piece happens. All the pieces are set up for the sequel. Little voiceover talking about what's going to happen next. And then, you know, kind of fade to black there. So I liked that. That was very nice because most of the times they're literally just like, well, we've got to stop the movie. Let's just chop it right here, you know. And like, oh, okay, so that's that. See, in part two, they didn't do that here. That was nice. But uh, the other reason I wanted to mention it is I saw a theory online that explains the Mission Impossible movies. They're all a computer simulation by the CIA to try to figure out how to actually handle these like near-impossible situations. And we're just seeing the ones where they find the successful solution. And, but now we also have the computer system itself is fighting back. That's why the villain's an AI, because it is an actual AI fighting against Ethan Hunt. And I was like, that's a long shot, but I can go with that. Gosh, for some reason I was thinking that. You are saying that, I was thinking, man, it reminds me of Ender's Game, except for where they thought it was a simulation. Yeah, yeah, you better not finish that sentence there, Jim. Why? Uh, that's, one of those, that's one of those spoilers I will refuse to tell anyone. Like, there, there's, there's basically like two. There's that one and Watchmen. Like, I won't tell anyone what happens at the end of either one of those. Because, like, that's one of those... If you're not going to take the time to watch it, like, you don't yeah. deserve to know. Because it's a doozy. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. So, that's the last movie I saw in a the theater. 
Uh, turned down the chance to go out to Oppenheimer and IMAX during Gen Con because I had a, another thing to go to that was more important and I'd already seen Oppenheimer, which you would know if you checked out our channel because I have a review for it, which you should totally check out. So, that's it on movies. On to streaming. So, I look, gotta get the name of this because I watched a movie the other day that is an adaptation of an anime series called Zom 100 Bucket List of the Dead. Now, I haven't watched the anime series, but I noticed that it sounded interesting, but then I saw there was a movie, and I was like, I'll just watch this. Basically, this guy is in Japan. Uh, guy wakes up, going into work. Oh, look at that! Zombies everywhere. Once he realizes that work's probably canceled for today, uh, which is like a major realization for him, because work really sucks for this guy. As I understand, it does for a lot of people in Japan. Uh... He uh, is he's like, hey, I'm going to make a bucket list because I'm probably going to die in the very near future. And I'm going to see how far we can get through it. And then somewhere along the way, picks up some other people and some other things happen. But uh, it's a decent zombie movie. Uh, part of the ever-growing like Asian zombie collection. Most of which are from Korea. But this one's from Japan. Uh, Asian zombies tend to have, a, like, they'll either have special rules or they move kind of different. They're, they're a little bit different from American zombie movies. They're worth checking out. Um, uh, with the pinnacle definitely being trained to boost on. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen a, I don't think I've ever seen a dubbed version, but I'm sure it exists. Uh, subtitles are just fine. Um, yeah, Train to Busan, excellent. Train to Busan sequel, not so excellent. Still good, but not excellent. I'm going to say my streaming zombie movie uh, recommendation is The Horde, which is a, I believe, I think, French. The Horde. Is that the one with the line you keep telling me about? Yes, yes. Okay. Where the guy We're not going to repeat here, but... <laughs> yes, it, it, it's, it is a, it, it's a, good, it's a good one. I mean, it, it all kind of takes place within a, one building kind of thing um, where, this, you know, the zombie apocalypse happens outside and everything kind of starts from there. Again, another one you have to, you know, unless you speak, you know, French or whatever, you're going to have to watch it with subtitles. But did not ruin the uh, the enjoyment for that movie. Um, it was a uh, it was it was good. Well, I know in this one, like like I said, a lot of them have weird special rules. In this one, it's that the zombies operate primarily on hearing. So the people figure this out, and so they start bringing like air horns and stuff with them to distract the zombies. Uh, this is a minor spoiler, but it's really awesome, so I'm going to tell you about it. At the end of the movie, they fight a zombie shark. And initially, they're like, oh, it's on land, it's not a problem. Well, it probably became a zombie from swallowing other zombies. So all of a sudden, a whole bunch of zombie legs just bust out of the sides of it from the zombies that are inside of it, and coordinate, and like stand it upright and start walking towards things. And then they're like, oh, well, shit, I guess it is a problem, isn't it? Because, you know, it's still a 20-foot long eating machine because it's a great white shark. So, yeah, it's uh, it's quite the thing. But it's, it's like two, two and a half hours long. Uh, if I watch the anime series, I'll let you guys know how it compares. But uh, it's a single movie as opposed to a show. Uh, so, but anyway, I, I thought it was good. You know. I was say, for my, my streaming movie, uh, it, it, it was a, well, last week or before that I watched it. Uh, was Caveman from 1981 with Ringo Starr and Dennis Quaid. I think I've caught clips of that somewhere along the way. Well, there's a... <laughs> it's, it, it, it's it's pretty good because, I mean, obviously everybody starts in the very beginning speaking Caveman, so they're like, you know, um, you know, like, so like everything, like food is like, ooh, you yeah. know, and stuff like that, and later they they do end up finding like the smart is like i, I want to say he's uh, like you know there's like the, there's like the smart caveman he's like no food and then you know, like you know but then you know the uh, the inappropriate act uh, zug zug and he's like so like zug zug and he's like okay zug zug <laughs> they did, didn't first snoo snoo um but but yes, there's a there's a point where they they stop a stop motion T Rex with a um, I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be a marijuana bush. They shove it in its mouth and he eats it and gets stoned off its ass and you know, yeah falls off a cliff after that. There you go. Um, but no, it's it's, it's 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 a good comedy. I mean, obviously one of those movies that would not fly today by any means. 
Oh, well. I mean... Let me ask you, like, are we talking, like, mildly inappropriate, or are we talking, like, blazing saddles? Well, we're talking about, there's a point where uh, Ringo's character is trying to get with this cave woman who's asleep. Oh, well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, um... I, I could see where that would be an issue. Now, yeah. like, they play it off as funny, because, you know, like, she keeps, like, rolling over, and then at one point, um... You know, he gets his legs like, you know, she, she like crushes his head with her thighs at one point kind of thing. So, so kind of like the movie Overboard, where it's all played for laughs, but in reality, like, that would be horrible to do to somebody. Yes. Yes. But, um, sorry, Kurt Russell. I'm a big fan of yours, but that one, that one's on a winner. Yeah. Like I said, you have to watch it understanding it is a movie of its time, but it's definitely worth a watch if you, if you can. Um, actually, I think it was streaming free on Tubi. Yeah, I come across stuff every time when I remember that Tubi's on there. Because every time I go on there, it's like, man, there's all kinds of stuff on here. Yeah, and yeah, I would say, you know, if you want to find a place to find streaming movies for, you know, for free, Tubi is a pretty good place to do that. The only problem is, is that uh, there's a lot of commercials. Yeah, I yeah, mean, that's what you get for it. But I mean, you don't pay for it either. So you know. there you go. But I say that's my streaming. I need to get caught up on a couple of shows because I mean we. When we did our Star Trek thing, we were talking about the uh, uh, Strange New Worlds. I've watched all season one, loved it. Well, yeah, I still need to get my the rest of why we threw season one on that. Supposedly in season two, there's a musical number at one point. I know it was a crossover with Lower Decks. Yes, I know, and I'm I'm looking forward to seeing that one too. Um, and I need to finish up Secret Invasion. Um, it just with Gen Con and uh, stuff at work, it just hard to you know get in and find time to you know stream all that stuff. Well, apparently on that front, everyone thought Loki was gonna be the next show, but I guess it's a sequel to the Groot show. Just kind of like just popped in out of nowhere in the schedule with advertisements and everything. So I guess that will technically be the next show, and then Loki season two, which that one I'm actually looking forward to. So, uh, but yeah, other than that, uh, there's a streaming show that I watch on Shudder. Uh, that's the horror streaming service, uh, which if you like horror movies, definitely check it out. Uh, although, if you're already subscribed to like AMC, I think if you get AMC Plus, I think it has that and Shudder and some other things, and it's like $2 more than any one of them, so it's probably the way I should be going on this. Uh, but anyway, the show is called The Last Drive-In with Joe Bob Briggs, who used to host a similar show on TNT called Monster Vision, and before that it was on... I don't know if it was Cinemax or the Movie Channel at the time, because on our cable network, those were the same channels. One just morphed into the other, and I don't remember which one was which. I'm going to say it was probably Cinemax, but I don't remember for sure. Anyway, he's like a host, kind of like uh, if you've ever seen Elvira's show, uh, where they have a host that kind of talks about the movie a little bit, and you know, when it cuts to commercial, it makes jokes, but on streaming, there's no commercials, so they just have to pick random points. Anyway, their season finale was a couple weeks ago with uh, George Romero's Day of the Dead, which is the third in his zombie movie trilogy, and uh, The Living Dead at Manchester Morgue, which you'd be forgiven for thinking it's a British movie, but it's actually a Spanish movie, apparently, and there was a whole bunch of information about Franco and not liking horror movies while he was in charge of Spain and all kinds of stuff. But uh, I'd seen both movies before, so... I watched it mainly for the commentary. Uh, but if any of you have Shudder or interest in anything like that, check it out. The only thing with his show is they're limited to the movies that are on Shudder. So, like, if you go back into past episodes, there's some seasons that half the episodes aren't there because they don't have the rights to the movies now. And I think once they get the movie, like, if the rights shift back to them, they do put the episodes back up. So, but anyway, worth checking out if you're a horror fan, for sure. Or if you're a fan of Joe Bob Briggs and wondering if he's still alive or something. They're five seasons in now, and uh, they always do like a, they usually do a Halloween special, a Christmas special, and a Valentine's Day special. So here in a few months, we'll look forward to the Halloween special. The uh, Valentine's Day special this year, they actually married some people because during the Christmas special, they auction off stuff, and one of the things they auctioned off was having Joe Bob preside over the marriage in Las Vegas, which he did dressed up as Elvis. Yeah, speaking of people that. I guess uh, in the news there was a uh, a thing for I guess there was a thing going on with viral death hoaxes where they say oh the celebrity has died and Sam Elliott was the most recent one. 
Oh, that one never made it to me. I didn't hear he died. He did I, not. I did hear... Uh, but, and it is just, it's just so you know, he did not die. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm just saying that the, the, I, yeah. I must not be social media literate because the hoax never made it to me. But uh, is it Paul Rubens? Is that yes. Hugh Herman? Yeah, he unfortunately did pass away. Uh, you know, definitely saw Hugh Herman. Back when he had his good buddy Larry Fishburne, before he started going as Lawrence, as Cowboy Curtis... Uh, yeah, he was in that. And, uh, and the Mystery Men as the Spleen. Yeah, the Spleen. I also liked him as the uh, like the second in command vampire in Buffy the Vampire Slayer the movie. Like Rudger Hauer was the main vampire. He was like his lackey, who didn't die at the end. But, that's, a, uh, that's another movie I, ha I need to have Owen watch as Mystery Men. Oh, that's you're gonna say Buffy the Vampire Slayer. But yes, definitely Mystery Men. All the superhero stuff we always like to watch and talk about, that would be a, right up there on a... Yeah. Yeah. That may, maybe we might have him watch Meteor Man. Now you're talking. I think, I'm pretty sure that's the last movie I saw at the Von Lee Theater in, in, in Bloomington. Not the Von Lee, the Indiana Theater. They have, two, they have two movie theaters on the same street up there. Or they used to. One of them is still a theater that occasionally plays movies. Um... Actually, a couple years ago, they were in the Star Wars movies. Just not like all at once. They were, you know. Yeah. But uh, anyway, the last movie I saw at the Vaughn Lee was one of the Pierce Brosnan Bond movies. Don't remember which one, though. So that's probably it for streaming. So uh, on to the topic of books, which this is mainly going to talk about actual books and not comic books here. So I'm in the middle of reading the Battletech novel Hour of the Wolf, which so far is very good. Uh, it's just taken a while because of being busy with other things. Uh, and I don't know if I mentioned this elsewhere, but a lot of the novels I've reviewed for Battletech are actually novellas. They're like 175, 210 pages, somewhere in there. This one's like 385 pages. Like, it's, it's an actual novel. And uh, just quick note... Before I do that, before I finish it and actually do a review, uh, it's very odd reading a Battletech book that actually takes place on Earth, fighting over locations I actually know about, versus like, oh, we're out here in you know, New Avalon and this you know this one city. It's like that's great, that's all fake. Like you know, it's a good book, but you know the other is like, oh, I know where I know where that is. You know, it's it's a little little odd. Because I think I've only read one or two other books that actually take place on Earth in the Battletech universe. So that was just kind of interesting. Uh, but so far the book is good. And once I'm done, I will definitely do a review of it. Uh, probably say something about it on here, but definitely do a review. So keep an eye out for that. Other than that, I picked up the newest Dragonlance novel at Gen Con. Uh, that'll be the book that I read after the Battletech book. So I uh, was able to actually get this one signed by... Uh, Tracy Hickman and Margaret Weiss this year. So, I'll probably have to take my one from last year back and have them sign it next year. We'll see. I try to get a bunch of them signed one year, and uh, I was able to get Margaret Weiss's signature, but Tracy Hickman, I could never find him. So, I got tired of hauling around like six hardback books for most of the convention and most of the next convention in a vain attempt to have them signed. So, we'll see. But I expect it to be good because the last one's good. In fact, I did a review of that one too. You should check it out. It's here on the channel. Yeah. I was saying, uh, uh, I'll, I'll link it in the description. I'll link it in the thing for the people that are actually watching this and what should put it in the description. So, Yeah, I've seen uh, on Facebook uh, a lot of this GalaxyCon uh, stuff, which I guess is a kind of a big convention that goes along with a lot of the big cities, and they always have who's going to be there, and you can sign up for autograph sessions and such. And they have two like may, like big packages for Star Trek. They have one where you can get um uh William Shatner and Walter Koenig on the same thing. Okay. Um and then the other one is you can get uh, the next generation That's check off, right? Yes. Okay. You can get um LeVar Burton um I don't think Beverly Crush, I think of her uh, Gates McFadden. Gates, yeah. Um Jonathan Frakes and Brent Spiner. I think it was is it even Brent Spiner. I think one of them one day it had Will Wheaton. I'm just saying. I'm, I'm just saying it was it was neat that you could get that many autographs and it 
The one with all, I think with the four of them was uh, like $325, which is not, honestly not that bad of a price to get four autographs. Yeah, I mean, to be able to get them all at once on the same thing, and the, yeah. The, the, the Shatner one and with uh, uh, Walter uh, was, um, was only like 285 well, what would we end up paying for the picture with Chad? Hundred and twenty. Yeah, something like hundred twenty. It um, got bumped up right after he went to space. I just remember that part because it originally initially advertised as a hundred. You know, and I mean, I I was like the second one in line uh, in that one session, so I don't know. If, you know, it was nice at least get it acknowledged, but it, I mean, they had the snot glass in there, so you couldn't uh, the sneeze guard, so you couldn't uh, actually like you know shake his hand or you know say hi. Yeah. Even, really, it was just kind of like. You know, take a picture of Alex and get the hell out of there. And it's like, you know, at some point I wish I could go back and get his autograph. I wish, you know, if I did, I'd have him autograph my picture of us. Yeah, yeah, for um, sure. It's just at the time, you know, as a as a single father, it's not easy to spend, you know, 200 bucks on, you know, at once on something like that. Yeah, so. I, I wasn't going to hit, that's, only, that's the only one of two pictures I have with a celebrity. And, you know, we go to Comic-Con every year, so it's not like there's a lack of celebrities to get pictures yeah. with. But I did that one because it's William Sh It's Captain Kirk. Like, yeah. you know, and also the man's in his 90s. Yes. Like, let's be realistic. Like, I, I messed up and didn't get David Carradine's signature, and, well, and I mean, no, no one saw that end coming. And I say the fact that he's the one that's still around kicking is yeah, really surprising to me. But Yeah, because I also got my picture taken, and I really regret... Not thinking it through and be like, wait a minute, plexiglass, like, I should be Spock here. You know, I'm, I'm pretty Star sure Trek 2. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure they did. Well, I saw one guy coming in behind me, two of them. One was dressed as Kirk from the original series. The other was dressed as the Gorn. <laughs> and uh, I think they actually went through twice and took a couple pictures. So, yeah. Well, because uh, the problem is, is that when you're in the Gorn outfit, they're not going to see your face. So it's like, yeah. But uh, for those interested, the only other one I did is myself and my friend Chris, uh, who we go to Gen Con with, and we got a picture taken with uh, John Rees Davies. And a uh, minor story, just going to take a moment here. Whenever Gen Con first came to Indianapolis, uh, they had celebrities, and the autographs were free because they were paying the celebrities. So we tried to get John Rees Davies' autographs. So I got Sala from Indiana Jones, of course, you know, and numerous other things. And... Uh, we got to the end of the line, and the guy's like, "Oh, sorry, we got to cut it off here. This is the end of the line." Like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, it's a line. Like, we can keep going. Like, it's moving. Like, he's going to be here for a while. No, no, his airplane was late, and he's, he's got to leave early. And like, all right, fine, guy, whatever. Uh, there was also a woman dressed as a Tie Fighter pilot, and collectively, we were pretty sure we could take the other guy, but you know, didn't have any place to stash his body except under the stage. So we not we'll have to not go for that plan. Uh, so. We didn't get it there, and then like 13 years later, he was at Comic-Con, and we actually had a minute to talk to him beforehand, and we mentioned it to him, and he's like, well, thanks for coming back, guys. And then, uh, while well, we're sitting there at the picture, uh, I don't know what he did to Chris, but like, he definitely was holding me like right here, and like, literally like grabbed or tried to tickle or something. I don't know. Chris, the way Chris explains it was, grabbed his ass, so I'm pretty sure he didn't, actually, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. As well as like, well... You know, if it's got to happen, Sala, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I've got a picture of that somewhere. Uh, now, the only autograph I did bother to get, which was also free, was Tracy Lords. Do you know who she is, I assume? Um, is she of the adult yes. Kind of variety? Yes, she's an adult film star, notable for the fact that most or all of the movies she's in, she's actually underage, so they're all technically illegal. Um... Uh, but uh, she's also in a few sci-fi movies. Like, she's in the first Blade movie. She's the woman that brings the guy to the club at the very beginning of the movie. Um, she's in Virtuosity. Uh, she's a couple movies on the sci-fi channel. So, like, there was, like, a sci-fi fantasy reason for her to be there, but I think she also wrote a book. Uh, but, yeah. So, later years, you had to pay. And then, eventually, the whole autograph thing pretty much died off there because Gen Con's just not really that kind of convention. Um, yeah, one year Kevin Sorbo was there, and that man is every bit as tall as he looks on screen, let me tell you. Like, he is very tall. Uh, but yeah, uh, Walter Koenig was there, David Carradine was there, 
I believe Richard Roundtree was there. Uh, Mark Singer was there. This is all in the same year, by the way. So it had Chekhov and or Bester, uh, Kwai Chan Kane from Kung Fu, or Bill from Kill Bill, if you prefer, uh, The Beastmaster, Shaft, Hercules, and uh, uh, there's a woman named Bai Ling who played one of the Jedi in the the prequel series. Uh, Shock T, I think. So Chris and I couldn't help but notice there was like a pricing chart because everyone had the same price. And at the very bottom in kind of small print was nudes. And we were like, presumably that only applies to Bai Ling, but we're like, we can see Carradine maybe selling them to you. <laughs> so yeah. But uh, we didn't go for those. Uh, there were some of the folks from Mythbusters, not the main guys, but like the, the, the other crew, the other yep. three. They were there, and Chris got their autographs. So, but Yeah. So we're, we're not super into autograph stuff, but you know things like Shatner, it's like... I said the uh, first uh, autograph that I got at a convention was um, in McDermott. Yeah. I do kind of regret not getting... Well, really kind of regret not getting uh, Carrie Fisher's autograph. But uh, Ian McDermott, yeah, that's one I should have gotten. Hopefully he'll make it back around. I did, man, well, Chris got this for me. Uh, I did get uh, the guy that plays Flash Gordon. And I can't think of his name. Where I've uh, it's Sam something. Uh, I did get him to autograph. Uh, Chris had bought an album, like a record, for this Flash Gordon soundtrack, uh, knowing he was going to be there. And I bought it off of him, he autographed it and everything, so I'm going to get that mounted for display. So, anyway. Uh, and so if, for you, you, you all that are watching right now, uh, I'm here uh, posting some stuff up on our Facebook, uh, uh, Facebook page, uh, the Geek Cabal on Facebook. Because um, we've got a uh, one of my cats here that's just flopping around trying to be all cute. Uh, so... Uh, she's keeping us entertained while we're filming here, so or recording whatever we're doing here. Yeah. So definitely, uh, you know, follow us on there if you you know have a chance, because obviously anything to get, uh, you know, you know all the latest news, what we're recording, what we've just put out, that kind of stuff. Communicate with us makes it a little bit easier. Uh, and likewise on Twitter, you know, at Real Geek Cabal. At so. X. Yeah, sorry, on X. I'm not going to call it X. That's ridiculous. Maybe they should just come by and call it Twitter X. Twitter X. The 10th edition of Twitter. Um, but yeah. So, now we've thoroughly drifted from the topic of books. Well, bit... I can say there is one topic for books. Um, it's not for me, but uh, my son Owen, at some point, he should be uh, uh, doing a recording. He's going to record a, uh, a comparison of uh, the hunt for Red October versus the movie. Uh, he saw the movie... Really liked the movie, wanted to read the book. He read the book, so i uh, be looking forward to that. So he'll get to do a review and uh, kind of explain where it, where it differs. All right. We'll definitely look forward to that on the channel. So, on to the topic of gaming. And given that we just went to Gen Con, we're probably just going to have some general Gen Con thoughts and comments here. So, Jim, uh, anything? Well... The, the one I uh, and I kind of got after my son a little bit on this one is that he wanted to, he's like, well, we need to stay later. We need to see if there's some games we can play. I'm like, listen, it's like, I, I understand that, but it's like, I don't even know what is available. I said, this is where we were supposed to go through the, um, you know, the, the, play the event game, catalog, the event catalog, find games to play. I tried to do that with him. He didn't want to sit down and do it. So I said, if you want to do it next year, this is what we're going to have to do because there were some places, because there was one that he definitely wanted to do after he saw uh, some people playing it. And I think we could have probably got in on that, but I don't know what time frame they were open. And it's like, it was it was getting late. My legs were killing me. My back was killing me about that point, even after all the wearing the proper shoes, drinking plenty of water, that kind of stuff. Still was... Man, Jim, after you left, I went to an event that lasted until 11 o'clock, and I stayed there through the whole thing. But... Um, that was the uh, the Call of Duty um, horror game, which yeah. actually looked kind of neat because uh, yeah, it, it, it utilized uh, 
like D and D like type screens. And what you would do is you would plan out your moves. Yeah. Because like each person would have like a miniature map of the map, and you would have to put like plan out like where your character is going to move, and where they're going to stop. So it was kind of a neat idea. I'm actually kind of looking forward to see you know where that goes. Um, but now some of the games that we looked at were um, so I've got. Uh, my youngest son, he's uh, on the autism spectrum, so trying to find a game that will keep his attention, because he's also ADHD, so trying to find something that he'll be able to play. So we found a, a co-op game, um, and we got that from the uh, Catalyst Board Games booth. Oh, okay. Uh, and that's the one sitting on the floor down there, the Awakening Lair. So at some point I want to, you know, uh, us to play that one. Maybe even do it on do it as a video, but it's supposed to be like a co-op dungeon crawl. That sounds cool. Um, Owen got the Alien uh, Fate of the Nostromo, which you can play as a one-player game. Well, if one person survives, why not? Um, he says it's obviously not much of a challenge, though, because the part of the challenge is that as everybody's doing stuff, you're pulling cards saying the alien moves closer, the alien moves closest to the, the nearest person because you're making sounds, you're, you know, uh, you know, doing things like that. So as one player, you're not, you're not having that as, you know, happen as much. It sounds a bit like Pandemic. If I remember right, it's been a while since i played it, but if I remember right, it did seem like the fewer players might be actually be in your best interest. Yep. Oh, uh, but it's been a while since i played it, I might be misremembering. Yeah, and then the other one that we got is a card game uh, about moonshine. Ah, oh, so there you go. Yeah, I uh, picked up the Settlers of Catan uh, card game, Rivals for Catan, because it's a dedicated two-player game, and I don't think I actually have any two-player games. I've got games that you can have two players, but are all better if you have more than two players. Uh, so this being a dedicated two-player game, and I like Settlers, so... Uh, that's a game we should definitely talk about at some point. Uh, Settlers of Catan. But also, I'm really hoping in the next few days I'm going to have a chance to play that game. So if I do, we'll be able to talk about it next time. Uh, I also picked up the like second edition version of Disney's Villainous. Uh, they changed some of these streamlined some things, did some stuff. I don't know. Bought it for my sister, and to get a promo card that I turned around and flipped for like $120, so... That's all uh, rough. Yeah, that's yeah, real rough. Uh, so, also on the Gen Con topic, for those of you that are not following us on Facebook that didn't hear about this otherwise, apparently the night before the show started, which had been Wednesday night of last week, uh, I believe it was Wednesday night, uh, someone walked out with like $300,000 worth of trading cards. Like literally like Pallet Jack took a whole pallet and just whoop, out the door. So far the police have not arrested anybody which I would wager they're not going to be able to easily arrest anybody if they haven't arrested them yet, because there's a very high probability that person's not local. And if they couldn't figure it out by now, like, the old image enhancement only does so much. It's not, it's not like the CSI TV series. Um, or somehow you can get, like, even a sharper image than the camera's actually able to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that happened. Uh, also, apparently there was, like, a whole, like... I guess Wednesday night, early Thursday morning, people began to line up for the Lorcana card game that was made by Ravensburger. Uh, this is a Disney card collectible card game, uh, similar to Magic as far as like conceptually, like how you acquire it. But I'm guessing the rules are different. I didn't play it, so I don't know. Uh, and I don't play Magic anyway, so I wouldn't know the difference. Uh, but this game was like wildly popular because this is where it first premiered. It's not actually available for retail yet. And from what I'm reading, it might not be for a while longer because people's orders are getting, uh, I don't know the term, but essentially throttled. Like conceptually, the same thing is being throttled. Like you order 10 booster boxes, you only get one. And uh, so people started lining up, I think it was early Thursday morning, and sometime around 5 or 6 a.m., someone just crashed the line, and a bunch of people followed them in. So people that had been there for hours all of a sudden found themselves not anywhere near the front. And, uh, yeah, I mean, on the one hand, jerk move, but on the other hand, it's not really an official line. So, 
I mean, you're kind of really just a mob of people in rough organization at that point. Like that's that's my take on it. Like it's it's a dick move, but well, don't worry, karma will find those people. I. Well, I'm just saying, like, if it's not really an official line... I know, like, I know, I know, but karma... Karma yeah, will I'm hit not, this. I'm not, you know, I don't advocate it. You know, I'm not, not saying you should do it. But on the other hand, like, if it's not really an official line, like, you should kind of expect that that's going to happen. It just makes you wonder, though, like, it, was there something wrong with, like, the printing and stuff? That's the same thing, like, when uh, uh, you had me wait in line for uh, the WizKids booth to get the, uh, <laughs> the Hawkeye and Hawkeye figure. Yeah. Um, and it was only on a Saturday. You think by Saturday you would have enough figures? Well, the Lorcana thing was a matter of everyone and their brother wanted in on it. Oh yeah, I know. I so get that. The the Hawkeye the the Whiz Kids booth. That's more they just didn't bring enough stuff. Okay, and I, I don't know. I don't work for Whiz Kids. I don't know if that's because like the other container fell off the ship from China or something, or they just didn't make very many of these things. I don't know. I just know they didn't bring enough of them. Uh, so, you know, there could easily be a perfectly valid reason for that, or they just didn't make enough. I don't know. Now, with the Heroclix promos, that's bad, because they don't remake those. Uh, with the D&D promos, they've remade whole, they've reprinted D&D sets. So there's nothing stopping them from reprinting D&D promos, as far as I'm aware. Uh, except that then it'd be slightly less exclusive, and then they wouldn't get the crowd rush. And So I don't know. Uh, but yeah, so that, that, that kind of sucked, because I knew a couple of people wanted those figures. But Anyway, uh, I don't think I picked up anything else game-wise. I picked up some more Battletech stuff. Uh, so... Definitely look forward to potentially numerous Battletech product reviews in the very near future. Uh, those will be video components because you need to see them. Uh, except for the book review once I do it. But, uh, yeah. You need to be able to see them. Like my quality new House Lao hat, for those of you watching the video here. For those of you not, it's the House Lao symbol on a hat. So, you know. That's like a Owen got a... Uh... The, a Black Mesa hat, and then yeah. a Black Mesa uh, t-shirt, and that's uh, from Half-Life, if you don't know what Black Mesa's from, but... I don't. I don't play Half-Life. Well, Black Mesa's also the name of the remastered version of where somebody redid all of Half-Life and, uh, you know, better engine and all that, and it's called Black Mesa. It's not, hmm. not called Half-Life. I don't right. know if it's official or not, to be honest, but... So, any other gaming news topics anything well uh, sorry i shouldn't have said that because i actually did some other things uh, i bought some other dcc stuff dungeon crawl classics which we're also going to be reviewing soon so we'll go ahead yeah well i was gonna say the uh, the one thing that uh, was kind of great uh, about us going to gen con was actually meeting one of our fans so that was a uh, yes that was yes. a uh, a humbling experience to have somebody you know that really liked our content enough to be able to meet us out there and you know uh, uh meet brian and uh, Patrick. And Brian, Patrick. Brian and Patrick. Well, yeah. I didn't get to meet Patrick. I only got to meet Oh, Brian. that's right. You didn't get to meet Patrick. Yes. I, I, met, I, I met the two of them, and J uh, Patrick was not with Brian whenever we, he met up with Jimmy here. And I apologize, apologize, Patrick. I would probably like to meet you as well. And, but I did. It was it was definitely nice, and we got a picture. It's up on the Facebook page as well um, of that. So um, it was good to get some actual feedback and some... Um, yeah. And finding that we're, you know, kind of inspiring others to... You know, not not be so intimidated by this because hell, you don't have to be a professional to do this. I mean, hell, we're not. No, we God could, no. I mean, there's there's barely times that we can know how to speak and act and their equipment. <laughs> still trying to figure it out. Uh, there's one thing I forgot to you know mention at the beginning. There is that uh, uh, right actually before we filmed this, I filmed my uh, next uh, unboxing old stuff video. So that should be uh, up. You know, I don't know if we're up, up before this one or not. But definitely look out for that because that is a uh, interesting. But you can also see that we're still new with the camera because it had an issue with auto focusing or wanting to like trying to balance the light when I was uh, showing stuff on camera. So uh, as I say, just just so you know, I'm probably going to put this up first. Uh, 
because we released the other one last week, and I would like to at least try to try to get close to weekly. So I think this is probably going to be going up first. Well, yeah, this will will take less to edit anyways. But anyways, definitely look out for it though. So, gosh, John, nope, cats are uh, attacking the microphone cords. Attack, attacking the microphone cords. So that's that's fun. But um, we already got a first reaction on, yeah, Sarah. She she liked our guy uh, put on the Facebook page that uh. The ginger's here keeping us entertained. Oh. And ginger's my cat, if you don't know. So, um, she's there trying to knock the mic, uh, knock, uh, pull the microphone cables out, trying to knock the camera over, trying to chew on my Aquarius box over there. Uh, and the Aquarius is the what I am box. So, interesting stuff. Anyways, I think we're on to. On to miscellaneous. So, well, one of the, um, uh, reviews I was watching was on the uh, Transformers comic, and y- you can see that the way that the co- the comic book and like this also goes on with the cartoon shows is why they jam pack so many new characters into those things is so that they can just sell as many toys as they possibly want. Sure. Uh, there's even one spot where in the comic they um, it was this human organization called Rat, which was a robotic. Um, something anti-robotic task force that the humans had created i don't know some you know um, abbreviation for that but like they had like taken apart all of these robots and like put them on platforms with their name plaques on it i'm like they're specifically doing that so that you remember like these are the names and sure of each one of the robots and stuff and i guess at one point there was a uh, a line of toys called headmasters where you could swap the heads yeah, from different Transformers, and they had a comic book series that did that. And not only could the Transformers be headmasters, but so could the humans. The humans could swap their heads onto robot bodies. Well, it's funny you should mention that. Uh, in the G.I. Joe comic, which as we mentioned earlier, both are owned by Hasbro. Both comics used to be made by Marvel Comics back in the 80s and early 90s. So the Transformers line died out for a while, but the G.I. Joe line was still going. So they used the G.I. Joe comic to relaunch the Transformers line. There's like four crossover issues with the Generation 2 things. That's where Megatron gets upgraded from the gun to the tank. Cobra is the one that does that for him. And uh, because this comes off of some issues where Destro and Cobra Commander had a huge falling out. So Destro like leaves his castle and like, throws a switch that causes the whole thing to start transforming. And Megatron's like in Antarctica and detects it and thinks it's another Transformer. He gets there and he's kind of pissed off. He's going to kill everybody. And Cobra Commander's like, hey, how about we make a deal instead? The guy I'm listening. He's like, we can upgrade your weapon systems at you. And in exchange, like, I don't know, give us some of your stuff. So he agrees. And uh, he gives them what, in his mind, is a bunch of scrap. But, you know, to Cobra, would be absolutely invaluable. So as it's progressing, the Joes are like, man, we can't let Cobra get a hold of this stuff. So first you see Mainframe like pulls this circuit board out of nowhere and someone's like, what the hell's that? He goes, I'm going to make a really long distance call and plugs it in to call like Cybertron. But also one of the headmasters is still on Earth. And so like the guy turns into the head for the headmaster and like goes and takes out the, the semi-trailer full of all that crap. But he wasn't very powerful because like a bunch of his tanks took him out. So... But, uh, yeah, so, like, that was part of the crossover there. And then from there, the Generation 2 line takes off. Well, and that's what I'm wondering with the this, this line of movies, if Hasbro is not trying to come back and say, you know what, let's put stuff out there and actually sell some toys. They, the only problem I have with a lot of that is that a lot of the Transformers as of late have not really been that good. Some of them, like, we had uh, uh, some of the Transformers uh, toys from... The original Michael Bay film, uh, one of them was a bumblebee that turned into the Camaro. And one of the problems I had with it is that it was almost way too complicated to actually transform and try to get it to to fit together properly. Well, versus like I have my still have my you know my original Optimus Prime. He's not the he's not this first series, but he is he's the one that actually had on his trailer had a um, like a, a sound pack where you could push buttons and he would say hmm. like some phrases and yeah. stuff like that. I still have mine, and when I bought my when I got mine new for Christmas, he was he was always missing his hands. 
it came missing his hands. Mm-hmm. So I could never put the guns in his hand. That sucks. Uh, but I still have it. Uh, he's not in the best condition. But when I look at that and how, like, how he transforms, is just the, the way that Generation, Generation 2, the older Transformers period, the way that they transformed was just a lot smoother operation than these ones where they want him to be so detailed and then it's like well, you you yeah. lose some of the you know the the playability with it at that point it's like oh i need to transform my character hold on i need to pull out this instruction manual on how to transform it back i'm not joking there are some that would literally come with an instruction manual to show you how to transform it back because it would be so complicated and i'm hoping if they do use this to release a new toy line that they try to go back to something that's Looks good, but it's maybe a simpler design. Well, at least it's not like the Unicron figure from the HasLab that takes almost two hours to transform from robot mode to giant death sphere mode and comes with like the equivalent of like a hardback book for the instruction manual. It's got like 180 pages to it. It's, it's something just absolutely ludicrous. But in robot mode, the figure is like two and a half feet tall. So, but... No, I, I, the only one, the only Transformers I bought recently are, uh, and I haven't taken them out of the box yet. Hopefully Soundwave. They're, uh, why? Soundwave's awesome. Well, they haven't released one I'm going to buy yet. Uh, because they've been releasing them specifically from the animated movie. And so I I bought a number of them from there because they finally made a Soundwave figure like I always wanted from, from his very brief moment where he's the leader of the Decepticons, comes with the crown and the cape and everything. Just before Galvatron turned him into a pile of ash. You mean Starscream? Yeah, Starscream. No, that's fine. Um, yeah, that's the other thing I learned in the comic is I guess for a while Shockwave was leading the Decepticons and Megatron was like, yeah. Hey. Sh- well, while well, well, they were all stuck on Earth, Shockwave was out there winning the war. Well, I guess at some point Shockwave ends up on Earth in the comics and uh, Shockwave pretty much supplants Megatron as the leader, and for a while Megatron's his second in command. Yeah, wouldn't surprise me. Uh, because Megatron's driven way too much by emotions, while Shockwave is more logical about things. Yeah. Um, but no, kind of my thought was that that's a that the, the generation we grew up in, we had all these cartoon shows and all of these, you know, like the comic books, all this media to promote toys, and I think that to a point that they there's things in place now where they can't do that because. No, actually, I'm pretty sure it's the opposite. You know why it was like that back in the 80s? Because before the 80s, you couldn't do that. And then something changed, and you all of a sudden were allowed to do that. And so that's why the 80s is like the golden era of cartoons, because they did that, but they also didn't know, like, hey, we know those are for kids and everything, but, like, kids aren't idiots. Like, let's make these shows, you know, not completely stupid. Unlike once you drift to like the early aughts where it's just like most ridiculous, like it's, you know, it's stupid levels of humor. And I mean, the the amount of shows that we got, um, the amount of toys that that came from that, I mean, it's it's, it's a thing that is going to be pretty much lost because, I mean, you just don't get that anymore. You don't get all of these, I mean, hell, most of the shows now are just mindless stupidity without any, you know anything really to show from it and i mean the, the the things that you get are from you know maybe like japanese anime you may get figures from that um we just don't get that kind of quality like you know cartoon type shows anymore right and i, I think part of that is like i said you know the writers of the time like we're actually trying to make a quality product i mean quality kids product you know but like the gi joe cartoon there's a few episodes that are actually kind of have some very horrific things happening you know, and then you have the episode where they like go to the sauna, and some of them get turned into kids, and some of them get turned into old people. Like it's give and take, but or the Doctor Mindbender creates mind controlling chewing gum at one point, which genius move. But you know, uh, for the GI Joe cartoon in particular, I saw a thing about it because I think it came out before whatever that change was I mentioned, and so their workaround was. The cartoon was actually an advertisement for the comic book, was what they tried to tell everybody. Even though the two had like radically different storylines. Uh, minor diversion here, folks. Here it comes. 
The G.I. Joe comic book was written all but one issue of the original 155 issue run was written by Larry Hama. That just doesn't happen in today's comics. Uh, it rarely happened at, at that point in time. So he controlled the whole comic book line. And he said before, like, yeah, they tried to force new things in there. Like, they told him, you will include Serpentor. And he's like, all right, fine. And then, and then had Zartan shoot him in the head with an arrow later to kill him. Because he hated the concept. So he made sure he went out like a total punk. Uh, but he would stick with, like, using, like, the Cobra soldiers and Vipers all the time, even though it was, like, well into the 90s when there was no possible way you could get those figures anymore because they came out in 1984 and 6, respectively. So, like, he just stuck with what worked, in his opinion, and later comics did, too. They'd throw in the occasional specialist Cobra guy, and, like, they'd rotate the G.I. Joe roster a little bit, but the comic was pretty locked in place. Then the cartoon would find excuses to use the other Cobra soldiers, but a lot of times it was still just the regular blue Cobra soldiers or the Vipers or the Bats. The bat they used the Bats because they could shoot the Bats because they're robots. Because the uh, the old GI Joe cartoon has an approximately zero percent fatality rating. Yeah, even with the poor people that were in the Cobra bubbles. The Trouble Bubble. Yes. Yeah, they remembered wearing their parachutes. Yes. Like all good Cobra soldiers. But I mean, there was like nothing to that vehicle. Like their leg didn't their legs dangle from the bottom yeah of yeah it, any any realistic physics of that you'd be dead if that thing got shot <laughs> you wouldn't have to worry about crashing you're gonna get shot you're gonna get killed in the initial hit i mean that's that's like the tie fighter of the cobra well they had those both sides had hang gliders with weapons on them uh the joes even had some vehicles like that too but yeah i mean kind of crazy looking back on it which we should at some point but yeah, so that was the workaround for that one. And I imagine since Hasbro made both, that's probably the workaround for the Transformers, too. Was to say that it's really just an advertisement for the comic book. Because Marvel made the cartoon. You know, well, if, you ever, if you ever see it, it's Marvel and Sunbow, Sunbrow. And I think the problem is, is that now, in today's world, the, 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 the target demographic moves faster away from that than what they did in the past. Because, I mean... When we were, you know, I don't know, 10 to 13, probably in that age, um, we would have been all into that. But I, I think, you know, hell, by the time you're 12, you know, 12 or whatever, that kids are already moving on to playing, you know, video, video games, games and yeah. stuff like that. And, you know, having action figures isn't really a thing. So it's like, hell, half the shit they make is well, I mean, for an adult I, audience. Yeah, I mean, the current G.I. Joe figures are for adults. They're six-inch figures that cost almost $25. Like, kids aren't buying those. I mean, a kid... Okay, there might be a handful of kids that are buying them, and if you are, they're awesome toys, I imagine. But they're... Uh, no, those are for adults. Same with the Marvel Legends figures, and, you know, same with the McFarlane Superman figures. Which, which is also why I think a lot of the, the toys for kids are also of a way lesser quality um, than, like, where they're... You know, where they don't worry about articulation. They don't worry about durability yeah um i mean that's i mean hell i've got some of my uh, got some original star wars figures still and i mean I, I can tell you that they were played with and all that stuff but they're still there and still around and same type of figure made nowadays you'd be lucky if they last a couple of years before dis yeah. disintegrating into nothingness yeah except for lego lego's awesome yeah I've got a couple of sets I should bring in sometime, and, and we can do a, a review on. I've got a McDonald's Lego set. There you go. Um, I, I have a recent one that I plan on doing a review on, so. Nice. Like, literally, like, literally just came out at the beginning of the month. Oh, yeah. Hey, and uh, if you saw the, um, the Enterprise uh, building block sets that we did, um, I actually got uh, some more uh, Star Trek sets ordered. I've got some... Uh, uh, clean on vessels, the D7 battle cruiser and a uh, bird of prey that I will be uh, putting together. Maybe on this one, I'll actually record me actually assembling one of them at least, so they you know kind of go through that. We did actually try to record the other one, but um, turned out you know you might want to make sure you can see if your phone's still on when you're recording it. Uh, yeah, we ran into some technical difficulties on that one. So you're like, hey, we're just about done, and like, oh well, my phone had been dead for you know. 30 minutes at that point. It's like, well, shoot. Yeah, well, that was, uh, and mine was dying, and we were having to look up the instructions on my phone, and yeah, it was just bad. 
So uh, it's a great thing about learning about um, putting all this, you know, video and stuff. It's it's a learning process every day. I mean, every single yeah. time our videos may look a little bit different because we're trying something a little bit different. Uh, you know, like, you know, today we're trying the camera in a little bit different spot, uh, trying the lights in a little bit different area, see if that helps with the, you know, worth it not uh, auto-focusing and dimming and doing all the weird crap it likes to do, so. Yep. But, but uh, yeah, I mean, to Jim's point, I, I, I think, like, just looking at my sister's kids, William, I don't know what toys he actually ever played with. Like, he builds Lego sets, but then that's it. Like, and I've even bought ones that are like, you're supposed to do stuff with them. And he's just like, well, what now? And I'm like, well, it's, it's, a, it's a monster truck. Like, you know, drive it around. Like, what do you mean, what's next? He looks at me like like I'm talking like I'm speaking a foreign language. Like you're crazy. Drive it around. What the hell are you talking about? And I'm like you know use your imagination. You know. Yeah, I, I get that with the uh, with Grant, my youngest, because he's got an entire Minecraft village in the other room, and it's like get in there and play with it. Just he's like, but what am I supposed to play with? I'm like just get in there with your figures. Have like a little, you know, whatever. You know, I don't know. It's 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 a different generation. I mean, we had computers and stuff. Don't get me wrong. Um, that's a hell, that's a whole topic we could have a discussion about. Um, the times that, uh, me and Bobby would play, uh, Command and Conquer, uh, over dial up. Yep. So, you know, get, <laughs> get them up on the phone. Hey, I'm going to call your computer or you're going to call my computer and having to set <laughs> your computer ready to receive a call and, you know, hang up and then connect. And, you know, I think, uh, I think the remaster actually still has that option on the menu. Well, because uh, I played Command and Conquer with you, uh, uh, Dustin, uh, I played uh, Doom with. Uh, did We did death matches on Doom. Well, I just remember I had a Mega Man game, and uh, it only had three bosses and Dr. Wily. Yeah. Uh, but, like, on my computer, it was, like, four colors. It was, like, white, black, Teal and something else. It was, it was cyan. It was yeah. Big, yeah. Big. And uh, I never realized until I put it on someone else's computer. It was actually a full color game. It was just my computer couldn't handle the full colors. Like I put it on someone else's computer and I was like, "Holy shit! This looks like it is. This looks like a regular Nintendo game on here." Like that's what I get for putting this on a Tandy, I guess. Well, that and uh, even trying to get through the first level is almost impossible. Oh, I beat the game, but yeah. like, man, it was rough. <laughs> but yeah. 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 So yeah, I, the the toy market's weird right now. I think it's always going to be weird, and I think the problem is, is that once our generation gets to the point where they're no longer purchasing these types of figures, that yeah. Well, I I think Lego sees that. And I think that's why they're making more and more specifically adult sets. Plus, they can charge horrendous amounts of money for them, and they're apparently selling. But uh, no, this is kind of kind of related to this, kind of not. I actually saw a thing talking about, uh, you know, the Lego Friends line? And you know how, like, for the longest time, Lego just kept trying and kept trying and kept trying to make girl sets and just never could figure it out. Then Friends comes along and boom, it works. It's because they spent years and all kinds of money doing research on this to figure out what the problem was. And what they ultimately concluded was, boys and girls just don't look at toys the same way. Boys look at it like, say you hand them a Batman figure, you know... And all of a sudden, he wants to know everything about Batman. He's going to play with it as Batman. He's like, I'm Batman, you know, and stuff like that. And a girl... Where are the drugs? Yeah. <laughs> Where are they? You know, stuff like that. You know, <laughs> like, he's, that's what he's going to do, you know. And, uh, and with a girl, they see it, and they want to make it them. Okay, so if you hand him that, all of a sudden, Batman's going to be having a tea party or something. Yeah. And so that's just a huge difference. And uh, so that changed how they looked at the Friends line. And so they engineered it with that in mind, and it works. Like, Friends sets sell like hotcakes. I think some of them actually look really good. You know, there's definitely some design features I've seen, and like, man, I wish these were in the regular Lego sets. Hell, I'm tempted to buy them because it's the same scale. So that was another thing. They, they made sure they're the same scale. Even though the, the Friends, the little mini dolls, look different than the mini figures, they're a little bit taller, but all the entryways and everything, it's all the same scale as the regular sets. Because I've definitely seen some things there that I'm like, man, they should make this in a regular line. Well, and the one thing that um, 
I found, uh, you know, like I, I found out and some other, I, I've shown people that a lot of people think, well, you, you buy a Lego set and it's going to be for little kids and stuff like that. But there's actually like almost a therapeutic thing to it as well. Putting together, together a set, looking at instructions, just like putting together a puzzle. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's essentially, that's what it is. Just you have instructions for it. It's yeah. A, it's a 3D puzzle you have instructions for. Yeah. And I mean, it's, you know, there's actually some kind of therapeutic thing, so... It's definitely something, you know, as an, you know, as an adult, I don't think you should ever be, you know, shy away from that, uh, uh, that, oh, I can't buy that because it's for little kids kind of thing. Ha, that's not me. Well, I was going to say, there was a, one picture of one of the riots where there's a guy. Stealing, oh, yeah. The guy stealing the Lego sets and everyone's like, this guy knows what's up. <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, I mean... You know, I mean, I guess if that's going on, that's the guy had his priorities straight on what yeah, he needed. Yeah, I don't know. But, Seems like uh, it's an episode of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. You ever watch it? Yeah. Okay, but you know Danny DeVito is one yes. of the main characters. Okay, so he's talking about, like, there's about to be a hurricane or something hit, and he's like, I'm telling you guys, there's going to be a riot. You know, he's like trying to tell him what to do and everything. Like, how do you know so much? Frank goes, why well, is in the L.A. riots? He's like, they're like, what? And so he shows him a picture. It's him running out of a store with a giant big screen TV. Like, Frank, why were you in the riots? Like, you didn't have any problem with uh, with what was happening there in L.A. at the time. He goes, no, but I was able to steal a big screen TV, so that's what I did. And they're like, well, okay. And so they're in a the store there at the very end. Like, things are getting kind of dicey. And, like, the wind picks up outside. And Frank's like, this is it. And just starts yelling and riot. And everyone just starts stealing things and smashing the store up. And Yeah. There's, like, a hardware store. <laughs> Because <laughs> they're trying to get ready for the hurricane, you know. Oh, jeez. Yeah. So, anyway. Uh, yeah, and uh, like, like I said, I really will review that Lego set. It's a, uh, the Star Wars set. The uh, the mech sets. Not at all canon at all. But I could see the Empire using something like this. So, it's a Stormtrooper mech set. Uh, there's also Darth Vader and Boba Fett. But so far, I've only bought the Stormtrooper. But they look kind of cool. I'm going to put them in mind. If I ever make a big display with my Lego stuff, they're going in there for sure. Yeah, I was actually kind of surprised that our uh, that first building set video actually did pretty well. I mean, it's... Yeah. I think we're almost up to 100 views on it. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this one, I've already got the set built, but I bought a second one. Because uh, the Empire never built one of anything. Uh, so we might try recording building it. Maybe. But there's also some other things. I'll show you whenever I do the review that's kind of kind of interesting about it. Uh, so anyway, I think that's all we're on that topic. So we just got one more. I saw this in someone else's video recently. It was in the news a few months ago. Uh, and this is the kind of thing that might show up here in the miscellaneous news stories we can talk about that don't get stupidly political. So apparently someone is claiming that they have made a superconductive material that works at room temperature. Now, for those of you that don't know, and I'm hoping I'm getting this correct because I'm not a physicist or a material scientist, but I'm given to understand that the general idea is a superconductor has essentially no resistance to electricity. So, hence the superconductor. Although normally it has to be incredibly cold or under incredible pressure to work, which limits its uses. Something at room temperature if it actually works and doesn't just like disintegrate, then uh, yeah, that's like change the world kind of technology because all of our electronics will become considerably more efficient. Uh, the wiring in your walls will become more efficient. But the main thing will be the power lines because as it stands right now, whenever you generate electricity, you have to account for the fact that you lose some to resistance in the power line. And they're very conductive. They're the most conductive things that we can make at the moment. But you still lose, a, you still lose some, which given even just the U.S. electrical grid, and that's a lot at the end of the day. And so it would, it would reduce our consumption of resources to generate electricity, uh, which is good, and no matter what your thoughts on, on the Green Deal and all that is, doesn't matter. Us, us consuming less is always a good thing. So, you know. I was going to say, if there's anybody out there that's like, man, we need to be consuming more, I'd be like... <laughs> I mean, I... I yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, sh I, shouldn't say, I shouldn't say it's always better, because like, there are parts of the world where people are hungry, and obviously literally consuming food more is, would help. Yes. But 
generally speaking, consuming less is is the is a worthy goal because even though I'm of the opinion that our resources are probably going to last for thousands of years, they are finite. So accelerating using all of them is always a bad idea, you know, unless it's towards a goal of greatly reducing them somehow, you know, like spend a bunch of uranium now to somehow have fusion in the future, you know, that's an, that's an okay trade-off. Uh, but just in general, you know, you, you, the lines would be better. Uh, it should also mean that the power lines work over longer distances, I believe. So we literally could just put all the power plants in the middle of the desert where no one lives. Well, the the um, reason we use alternating currents because DC current can't go over long distances. Right, yeah. So. I, I saw something about that. Like the proposal was essentially giant batteries every few blocks or something like that. And uh, Tesla's like, that's stupid, do this. Well, I was going to say, Tesla was working on even a greater thing, which was a wireless electrical current. Being able to move it through the air versus... Well, uh, wasn't our uh, friend that we met up with there, wasn't he wasn't talking about something like that? He said he's in telecommunications, right? Yeah. And he's, I believe he was saying something uh, akin to that. So, I mean, supposedly Tesla had it figured out, just never implemented it. And there, there's still some things from his lab that people have access to, because the government grabbed most of it once he died, especially the earthquake machine, uh, which I believe... Uh, Mythbusters proved would actually work. Oh, where, they, where you uh, find the resonance of like yeah. a bridge or whatever mm -hmm. or a building, and if you can, and it as wasn't long as, as long as you can get on the right frequency, the oscillator will event, like the the waves start start accumulating and start shaking the whole thing, and it eventually collapse it eventually, you know. Which is crazy to think because it wasn't even a very big machine. No, no, it was like it was like a foot, maybe two feet across, just just an oscillating, you know, piece of metal basically. And they just had to tune it to the right frequency, and they were like at the other end of the bridge, and you could feel the the bridge starting to shake. So yeah, because the supposed story is that he couldn't, that Tesla was using it and couldn't turn the machine off, and like when the police got there, he's trying to smash it with a sledgehammer because it couldn't turn off, and it was starting to rattle the whole building it was in. So, because I believe the concept is it would start slow, but it builds and builds and builds until finally you hit the, the break point. So I, I think it's the waves hitting each other or something. Well, I mean, that's a lot, that's how a lot of the skys well, skyscrapers use a very similar type of technology to prevent them from falling in the middle of an earthquake. They put uh, weights and counterbalances at the top of it or, or in the middle or somewhere in the thing where it would counteract like as the yeah. building moves it would shift on a yeah, different it's got to be able to wobble just a little bit instead of being perfectly rigid which will which causes it to be uh no i don't think of the term here I mean, it means it can shatter yeah uh well it's rigid uh yeah it has to do with the uh the rockwell hardness scale diamond is 100 the hardest known substance on earth and chalk, there's nothing that's an actual zero. Chalk is the closest you get. It's a five. But that's why steel is the wonder metal. It's 55. So it has just enough give, but just enough hardness. So, but yeah. Something like that, superconductor at room temperature, that would change the game, like, for basically everybody. Speaking of scales, I don't know why it made me think of this. Um, but that FEMA uses the Waffle House scale. Oh, yes, the Waffle House scale. <laughs> oh. The last one being the building's gone. <laughs> yeah. So pretty much, um, uh, so yeah, so the idea is that um, if, uh, you know, green, like the, the, fir the, the main level, or the main level's green, where it's completely operational, you know, you're going to have a full menu, you're going to have everything. Uh, the next one down is that uh, supplies are... Uh, are, are interrupted so you have a limited menu uh the, the one down below that is that the restaurant has to have uh like generators to run but it could still operate yeah. and then the, the worst is that the building's gone it's just which is funny because if you look it up uh just look up the fema uh, waffle house index on um on on wikipedia and the image that it shows for the yeah that's the one i've seen before <laughs> just just a couple of bar stools 
and a Waffle House sign and, and no building, nothing left. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, I heard one guy talking about the Waffle House one time, because you, know, you see all these videos of the fights in the Waffle House. And he's like, well, you know, it's really the perfect setup. You know, you walk in, you, you get to see the combat arena, put the potential combatants, you figure out what you're working with. Then you got your two sides over here where you can take a little break, grab a waffle, grab a drink, and get back in there and, you know, go to it. Well, you know, and the last time I went to one, I was telling my dad, I was like, you know, that's the, the trademark of a Waffle House that people are going to be yelling and, you know, wanting to get in a fight. And, uh, well, there was almost a fight at the one I even <laughs> to, so <laughs> the people were yelling and, com and complaining because this one person's like, I had to walk into work. And I'm like, well, that sucks. And they're like, shit, I got to walk in. And it ended up being like two or three miles to get into work well, at a Waffle House. So I was like, okay. And then they were arguing about having to do that and that nobody would pick them up. And Pretty sure the last one I went to was a year ago. It was Gen Con last year. Sarah and I were driving to it, and Brad had called me. He'd gotten sick, and he was, he, so he was heading home. And so he's telling me, he's like, yeah, I'm pretty sure I got food poisoning. I was like, oh, yeah, where? He goes, at the Waffle House. And I was like, Brad, I have a question here. This, I'm going to tell you this is a very self-interested question. Like, where was the Waffle House? <laughs> and he started telling me, he's like, oh, okay, nowhere near the one we're driving to. All right, continue with your story. So, yeah. I don't know. Waffle House is good. I always get their we, we We didn't get food poisoning. We were fine. Uh, my sister Angela loves the Waffle House, which kind of surprised me. But It's good food. No, yeah. no. I, I Hell, until she and I went to one like four years ago, I'd never been to one. Like, because there's, there's none down here. Yeah. There, there used to be one in Evansville, and I think there used to be one in Bloomington, but there aren't any more. I think there's one in New Albany. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. We, so we have to either have to go up to Indianapolis or I think over in like Edinburgh and maybe Columbus has one. Yeah, so, they're, yeah. they're usually right off an interstate, which is surprising because there's with all the interstate around here now that that they don't have one thrown up because eh, maybe they'll put another one in somewhere. That's weird times we're living in, anyways. When Denny's isn't even twenty four hours here, so yeah. Well, I mean, you know the the WalMarts aren't anymore either. Although from everything I understand. That was coming before COVID anyway, because most of them, because of the because of the added expense of having people at the registers up front, the person at the door, having to call the cops because of theft, it wasn't making up for the sales. So, so they were they were going to be going. They were switching to not twenty four before COVID. COVID is just the excuse. They're just not going back. So they just use that time to stock shelves and do all that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they still stock shelves and everything. So. All right. So, yeah. There's some miscellaneous for you guys. Yeah. yeah there's some miscellaneous there for sure. So, uh, you know, as usual, let us know what you thought of the show. Uh, if you're listening to this purely on the audio, we do also have videos. on. You follow the links, which should be there on the audio part to our channel. It's the Geek Cabal channel here on YouTube. Uh, check out our Facebook, Twitter, uh, Real Geek Cabal on, sorry, on X. And... Uh, uh, Geek Cabal, Geek Cabal on, on Facebook. Facebook. Uh, but otherwise, you know, just let us know what you thought. Uh, at some point down the road, we are going to be looking at getting... Uh, uh, well, I say that. If the, if the sound's fine now, we might not. But I still do want to get an actual microphone, play around, see if it sounds better. But I just don't want to get into the black hole of, okay, well, then I've got to buy a second microphone, then I've got to buy a mixing box, and, you know... I don't know. We did When we did the uh, Gen Con video, we had... a we had these little lapel mics taped to the uh, to the table, and they didn't sound bad. Yeah, I mean, like I said, it sounds it sounds good now. So uh, I just want to see if the other sounds better. You know, especially for people that are listening to this audio only. Uh, but anyway, uh, so look forward to that maybe sometime in the near future. Uh, but otherwise, you know, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. If you have that option on. The audio only part? I don't know. If you're watching the video, please do that. Well, I assume they do. I assume they have the ability to subscribe to. I'm podcasts. assuming they do. I've really, I've really got to, we got to go in, not log in as uh, as us, but as me, and try to find it and see how it, see how it really looks on that end. Uh, but anyway, please do all that. Uh, but share it, comments, comments. What we really love because we know what you people want to hear us talk about. Uh, do you want to hear more of things like the superconductor thing or the toy thing or what we've been watching on the streaming? I'm assuming you do on the streaming because you watch the videos I do about the random videos I watch on streaming. So, uh, 
But anyway, uh, Jim, you want to lead us out here since you're the, the master of the outro comment? I don't know if I have any good outro comments, but I mean, you've already done the out the, the, the like, comment, comment, share, subscribe. But, anyways, this has been a Cabal Whispering podcast uh, brought to you by the Geek Cabal channel. And thank you for listening. Yes, thank you. See you later.